اللهم ظالمين ولا عاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. So tonight um, I was thinking about going into Ali ibn Abi Talib رضي الله تعالى عنه but I'm saving Ali for January for a reason inshallah which you'll understand in late January. So just a, a sort of a, an, a, an understanding of how we're going to proceed inshallah. So tonight we will cover the life of uh, a very particular special woman, Um Ayman radiallahu ta'ala anha. And then next week we're actually going to take a break from this series and we're instead going to talk about the Antichrist, the Dajjal, the false Messiah, and Masih al-Dajjal, and we're going to talk about the second coming of Isa alayhi salam. So we're going to talk about Jesus, peace be upon him, particularly about the return of Isa alayhi salam. So we'll break from the series for one week, inshallah, to talk about that, and then we'll take two weeks off, and then we'll uh, continue, inshallah ta'ala, in the second half of January with the <coughs> story of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But uh, tonight, again, we're going to talk about a woman that doesn't usually uh, get spoken about. So before that, I need to uh, set my bodyguards, inshallah. So someone to guard the manbar and someone to guard the camera, inshallah, to make sure that no one goes in front of the camera with the night ta'ala. And of course, none of the children or the adults run up to the manbar, inshallah. Um, some of the adults were thinking about it. I could see it in your eyes. Um, second half of January, we'll go to Ali and we'll continue. But who is this woman, Um Ayman, radiallahu ta'ala anha? Uh, um Ayman is someone I spoke about in the past in the stories of the, uh, particularly a series that I did a long time ago called Black and Noble, where I talked about some of the uh, famous black companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But I'm going to go a lot deeper into her story today because this is a woman that is unlike any other woman, in fact, unlike any other human being, is that, and that she was literally with the Prophet ﷺ from the moment that he was born until the moment that he died. There is no one else that could actually claim that distinction. Okay? Khadija radiallahu anha knew the Prophet ﷺ when he was in his 20s. Aisha radiallahu anha knew the Prophet ﷺ when he was an adult. This is a woman that would carry the Prophet ﷺ when he was born and stay with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam until the moment that he died and even outlive the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So to set the scene of Mecca and to understand uh, where this woman comes from, she was born approximately uh, 13 years before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So approximately in the year 557, because everyone knew that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was born in 570, right? Okay, two of you know, alhamdulillah. So she, she was born about 557, and she was from Abyssinia, and she actually was a slave from Abyssinia. Of course, they used to have, uh, particularly in the days of Jahiliyyah, in the days of ignorance, the slave market in Suq al uqad which was the famous market in, in, uh, in Mecca. And she was the only, uh, the only one purchased by the father of the Prophet wasallam, Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib, as a young girl, and he was the only one, uh, or she was the only one that was ever brought into that household. And so in the household of the Prophet ﷺ, you had Abdullah, Amina bint Wahab, and this one girl, Baraka, her name was Baraka, uh, bint Tha'laba, radiallahu ta'ala anha. So Baraka bint Tha'laba, Abdullah, and Amina lived together in this, uh, in this home, and Soon after the marriage of Abdullah and Amina, the parents of the Prophet wasallam, Abdullah actually set out onto a journey. Where do you think he went for his trade route? Where do you think he went? Syria, Asham, Greater Syria. I, I want to test your knowledge as we're going week to week to see if you're connecting things to the previous lesson because every single one is going to connect to the previous lesson. When would they go to Syria? In the winter or in the summer? They had two trade routes, Yemen and Syria, right? Why would they go to Syria in the summer? Because if you could go to Yemen or Syria in the summer, which one would you go to? No offense to the Yemenis. If you could go in the winter to Yemen or Syria, where would you go? Yemen. Okay, good. So they, uh, they used to go to Syria for their trade routes in, in, the, in the summer. Uh, when Abdullah actually left for Asham, he did not know that Amina was pregnant. Okay, he wasn't even aware that his wife was pregnant at the time. So he sets out to Asham, and a few months after he sets out to Asham, 
Amina uh, had a dream. And in that dream, she saw a light coming from her stomach, lighting up the hills and the valleys of Mecca, all the way to Asham, all the way to greater Syria. Now there's only one other person in the home at this time, and who is that? Baraka, okay? This young girl, Baraka. So she told Baraka, this Abyssinian servant of hers, what she saw, and said, what do you think? And Baraka said, you know, hopefully it's a blessed child with good news. You know, that's the only thing I could think about. And she noticed that Amina was getting sick more often, so she, she thought maybe these are the signs of pregnancy. And indeed, they were. So Amina became uh, pregnant. She spent a few months on the bed all by herself, longing for the return of her son, of her husband, Abdullah. And as she waited for her husband to return, she used to send Barakah to the place where the people would return from Asham every single day to see if the news had come that Abdullah had returned from Asham. So uh, Barakah would stay with her. She, she used to entertain her with the stories of Al-Habasha, the stories of Abyssinia, the stories, some of the things that she, she had heard. Um, she kept her good company. And every day she goes out looking for the return of Abdullah, the husband of Amina bin Wahab, until finally she went out and she was told that all that had gone out to Asham had returned and that Abdullah had not made it back with the caravan. Meaning that Abdullah, the father of the Prophet wasallam, passed away. Baraka was the one who was tasked with actually giving the news to Amina that her husband Abdullah had passed away on that, train, uh, on that trade route to Asham. She consoled the mother of the Prophet wasallam through that difficulty. She was the one that had to stay with her throughout her pregnancy. And when that day comes, when Amina goes into delivery to give birth to Muhammad wasallam, the only other person in the room was this young girl, Barakah. The first one to hold the Prophet wasallam. Think about that. The first one to hold the Prophet wasallam in her hands she said, I saw a light when the Prophet ﷺ was born. It came out of the house and I said, this is the interpretation of your dream. She held the Prophet ﷺ. She cleaned the Prophet ﷺ. She handed the Prophet ﷺ to his mother, Amina bint Wahab. She's one of three women who would nurse the Prophet ﷺ that is authentically narrated. It, it of course is the mother of the Prophet ﷺ herself, Amina bint Wahab and Baraka Um Ayman, and thirdly, Halima as saadiyah Halima radiallahu ta'ala anha would nurse the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he went out into the open desert, which was a ritual. They would, spend, they would spend some time raising the children in the open desert. So this is the first girl, first woman to hold the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nurses the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, takes care of the mother of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the house, it's only those three. When the Prophet ﷺ goes to Halima, she brings the Prophet ﷺ back. And Amina, and there are different narrations about how Amina bint Wahab, the mother of the Prophet ﷺ, actually passed away. Some of them say that she went out to actually visit the grave of her husband. And she got sick on the journey of going to visit the grave of Abdullah, the father of the Prophet ﷺ and her husband. And I want you to think of this scene now. When the Prophet ﷺ came out of the womb of his mother, into the hands of Baraka. Now she's sitting, Baraka is sitting there, and the mother of the Prophet ﷺ is dying in front of his eyes. Six-year-old orphan who never knew his father. The Prophet ﷺ never met Abdullah, never knew him. And he's watching his mother pass away. Amina actually whispered to Baraka and told her that I'm dying now after she, she had gotten that fever. And wasat baraka, she gave, she, she, she entrusted baraka radiallahu ta'ala anha. She said, take care of him as if you are his mother. Take care of him as if you are his mother. Care for him. Stay with him. Make sure that he doesn't know any sadness beyond this. So baraka radiallahu ta'ala anha was there the moment that the Prophet sallallahu came out into this world, out of the womb of Amina. And he was there the moment that Amina passed away in front of the Prophet ﷺ and had to console the Prophet ﷺ, a six-year-old boy, 
at the death of his mother, Amina. So think of the scene, scene two, holding the Prophet ﷺ, comforting the Prophet ﷺ. At this point now, she's only about 19 years old. And she is the only woman that the Prophet ﷺ really knows as that figure. Then the Prophet ﷺ goes to the house of Abdul Muttalib, his grandfather. And Abdul Muttalib dies when the Prophet ﷺ was how old? Just nine years old. Once again, she consoled the Prophet ﷺ at the death of his grandfather. So she was there when Amina died. She was there when Abdul Muttalib died. She stayed with him وسلم, throughout his entire life. Technically, technically the Prophet ﷺ inherited her, but the Prophet ﷺ freed her. So technically she was the inheritance of Abdullah to the Prophet ﷺ, but he freed her وسلم, as an adult. He stays with her and when the Prophet ﷺ marries Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, this was the woman that was with him his entire life. He introduces Barakah to Khadija with the following. He says, Hiya ummi ba'da ummi. She is my mother after my mother. And that was the way that the Prophet ﷺ would always refer to this woman. She is my mother after my mother. Meaning this is not just some servant, not just some woman that's to be disregarded. Hiya ummi ba'da ummi. Barakah did not get married throughout that entire time. So just like the Prophet ﷺ did not want to get married, he wanted to take care of Abu Talib and his children and, and serve as a productive member without, without being distracted by marriage or anything of that sort. Barakah also did not want to get married because of the Prophet ﷺ. And so when he introduced Barakah to Khadija, he ummi ba'da ummi, she is my mother, after my mother, the Prophet ﷺ said to her, Ya Barakah, I'm married and you're not, so maybe you should think about getting married now. She said, never. She said, I'm going to stay with you, Ya Rasulullah. I'll move in with you and Khadija, and I'm going to stay with you. I'm not going anywhere. The Prophet ﷺ told her, you donated your youth for my cause. Now go out there, you know, it's time for you to get married and to have a life of your own. She's free. She's not property anymore. She's free, right? She's not bound in any way to the Prophet ﷺ. And she insists, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha told her, also insisted, said that I will bring you the best of men and I will pay for all the expenses of your marriage. Remember Khadija used to do that for uh, the poor women, she used to pay for their wedding expenses, she used to pay the mahar, she used to do all of those things. She said, look, I'll bring you the best of men and I'll also pay for all of your wedding expenses. Barakah had said something very beautiful um, that, that just sticks and, and shows and shines in her life. Barakah said, I never left him and he never left me. Ma taraktuhu walam yatrukni. I never left him and he never left me. I've always been by his side. But after they insisted upon her, she agreed to get married. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, actually found the suitor for Barakah. And his name was Ubaid ibn Zayd. Ubaid ibn Zayd. And he was from Al Khazraj, the tribe in Medina and Yathrib. At that time it was still Yathrib. So he was a good man a nobleman from Yathrib, from the tribe of Al-Khazraj. Um, they got married before Islam. So this is actually before the Prophet ﷺ receives uh, wahi. And she had a son from him. Who can guess what his name was? Ayman. MashaAllah, you got it. All right. I, was, I said, if no one gets this one, I'm just going to shut this off and just stop. All right. There's no point at this point. All right. Um Ayman, right? Ayman. She had a son named Ayman. Uh, and Ayman would live to see Islam, and Ayman would believe, and Ayman would actually die عنه, as a shaheed, as a martyr. Uh, but her husband died before Islam. Her husband died before Islam. So she moved in with Ayman back into the home of the Prophet وسلم, and Khadija عنها, when the Prophet وسلم, uh, received revelation. When the Messenger of Allah وسلم, received revelation, we know that he came to the arms of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And obviously all of the family members were going to embrace Islam at some point. The second woman to believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was this woman, Um Ayman radiallahu ta'ala anha. So she's considered the second woman to believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Did not hesitate, believed in him immediately when she heard the message and dedicated herself to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam just like anyone. Uh, uh, who had loved him that way or knew his character, alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, would do so. Now, when she believed in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, 
and her husband had passed away, the Prophet ﷺ uh, said something about her, seeing her, her grow in her age and she didn't have a husband, she just had her child, uh, Ayman. The Prophet ﷺ said, and this is still in Mecca, مَنْ سَرَّهُ أَنْ يَتَزَوَّجْ امْرَأَةً مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ فَلْيَتَزَوَّجْ أُمْ أَيْمَنَ He said, look, whoever wants to marry a woman from Jannah, a woman from paradise, let him marry Umm Ayman. All right, she doesn't, her lineage is unknown. She's not wealthy. She's an old woman. She's a, she's a widow. But the Prophet ﷺ said she's a woman from Jannah. Guess who volunteers to marry her? Zayd ibn al-Haritha, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Zayd, who was at least, at least 20 years younger than her. Okay, Zayd was at least 20 years younger than Umm Ayman, had never been married before. Zayd said, if she's a woman from Jannah, I want to marry her. Because if she's in Jannah, then I get to be in Jannah too. Right, so he said, I want to marry this woman. And he volunteered um, herself. He rushed uh, to marry her. And this was about six years after the Prophet ﷺ received the message. Why? Because the child that would come from them, Usama ibn Zayd, was 17, turning 18 when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Okay, so this is about uh, six years after the Prophet ﷺ received revelation. Uh, Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu has a similar background in that Zayd also was purchased from the same souq, the same market, and freed by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu was freed and taken as a son by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Baraka, Umm Ayman, was freed and became like the mother of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But somehow, subhanAllah, they were married. And she was not expected to give birth. She was past the age of childbearing, she wasn't expected to give birth, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Hibbu Rasulillah ibn Hibbi Rasulillah, the beloved one of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the son of the beloved one of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's an interesting, subhanAllah, way that they both came into the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's house into a very, uh, through a very unique story, and they were married in a very unique way, and they had a child Usama ibn Zayd, who the Prophet ﷺ loved like his own children, right? Usama ibn Zayd would jump on the back of the Prophet ﷺ and sit on his lap with Al-Hassan, Hussein, Zainab, Umama. It was known that Usama was like his own child. And the Prophet ﷺ appointed him to be the commander of the Muslim army after he had passed away. And of course, there, this was to the objection of some people, that this young man, how is he going to lead the way, lead the army? But this was the son of Barakah, Umm Ayman, and Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. So she believed in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She married Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhum. She would give birth to Usama ibn Zayd, even though it wasn't expected of her to give birth. And when the hijrah came around, when the migration came around, she made the hijrah in her old age, and it was a very difficult journey for her. And there's an authentic narration about something that happened to her that, would, that was miraculous and that would have an impact on her for the rest of her life. During the hijrah of uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and at that point she was over the age of seventy years old, or she was reaching the age of seventy years old. So she's a, she's an elderly woman now, uh, making the hijrah, making that difficult journey between Mecca and Medina. Um Ayman radiallahu taala anha <clears throat> found herself in a situation where she couldn't find any water, and she was starting to worry that she wouldn't have anything to drink, that she was going to die of thirst. And of course, this happened even to the Prophet ﷺ, that there was a point in his journey where they go to the house of Umm Ma'bad, they, uh, they found the house of Umm Ma'bad, and that's where the Prophet ﷺ got something to drink. Umm Ayman ta'ala has a similar situation, and while this was happening, she tells the story, she says, فَلَمَّا غَابَتِ الشَّمْسِ إِذَا أَنَا بِإِنَاءٍ مُعَلَّقٍ عِنْدَ رَأْسِي she said that when I was, uh, when the sun set, she saw a, 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 a bucket coming down from the heavens at her head. And there was a rope that was holding it. And she said, Wallahi, I could not see the top of that rope. And she said, so I took from that pitcher, from that bucket, I drank from it and there was still water inside of it after I satisfied my thirst. She said, I dumped the rest of the water on my body to cool me off. And she was known for something. She says, بعد ذلك, uh, كنت بعد ذلك, 
أصوم في اليوم الحار ثم أطوف في الشمس كي كي أعطش. She said that I used to after that day, I would fast on the hottest of days. I would do tawaf under the sun. I would do all these different things. I would, and she said, Wallahi, I never became thirsty again in my entire life. So fasting was the easiest ibadah for me, the easiest act of worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even provided for me that water from the heavens in that difficult journey when I migrated for the cause of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When she got to Medina, her feet were swollen. The Prophet sallallahu looked at her with her face covered in dust. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her, Ya Ummah, O my mother, Indeed, for you is a place in Al-Jannah. So this was the second time that the Prophet ﷺ actually basharaha bil Jannah, gave her the glad tidings of a place in paradise. So he looked at her covered in dust, this woman that was with him uh, all the time, that was undergoing these difficulties still with the Prophet ﷺ and said that you have a place in Al-Jannah. Um Ayman uh, witnessed every battle of the Prophet ﷺ. She used to follow the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that she would go around the battlefield and she'd keep her eyes on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, like a mother, <laughs> and she just kept her eyes on him the entire time, making sure that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would not become hurt. At the end of the battle, she used to care for the wounded. She used to uh, she used to to to, to bandage those that were hurt. And uh, she used to she used to give even from her own abat, from her own clothes, to wrap the wounded as much as she could. In the Battle of Uhud, she was one of those who grabbed a sword and who started to swing around the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We know in the Battle of Uhud, many people fled from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and she was one of those who actually grabbed the sword and went to the side of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, to defend defend him while everyone uh, was fleeing away from him sallallahu alaihi wasallam her life was basically the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa kana idha nadhara ilayha sallallahu alaihi wasallam yaqul hadhihi baqiyatu ahli bayti when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to see her he used to look at her and he used to say this is the entirety of what's left of my family this is the entirety of what's left of my family so he would call her his mother ya umma he addresses her as his mother. He introduces her as Ummi Ba'da Ummi, my mother after my mother. And he says, Hadihi Baqiya to Ahl Bayti, that this is the entirety of the rest of my family. This is all I have. This is the only mother that the Prophet would know throughout his entire life, the only one that would stay with him throughout that entire time. Prophet used to visit her every single day. And on one of those visits, the Prophet ﷺ asked her, Ya Umma, O my mother, Kayfa Haluki, how are you? And listen to the answer that she gave. She said, Madam al Islamu bi khair, fa ana bi khair. She said, As long as Islam is good, I'm good. As long as Islam is okay, meaning as long as your message is protected, I'm okay as well. And that's just subhanAllah, something extremely uh Beautiful that she's showing the Prophet ﷺ her dedication to his cause. That at no point, at no point am I ever going to forsake you. I'm not going to complain. This is a woman that would live to see into her late 70s in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Would not tell the Prophet ﷺ, you know, my feet are hurting, my, my, my eyes hurt, I'm swollen, I've gone through all of this, I miss Mecca. She just tells the Prophet ﷺ that I am okay as long as Islam is okay. And that was something that would comfort the Prophet ﷺ. Let the Prophet ﷺ know that, uh, that she had his back, that she was dedicated to the message of the Prophet ﷺ throughout his entire life and no matter what he needed. Uh, what are some of the stories of the Prophet ﷺ with her? Her mawaqif, uh, her station with the Prophet ﷺ. Well, for one, she was extremely motherly. And uh, there's a funny narration from Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet ﷺ would visit her and if she was, uh, if the Prophet ﷺ was fasting or he didn't want to eat, the messenger that she would actually take, Jazakallah khair, speaking of food and, I'm not fasting by the way, my throat just hurts. Um, <clears throat> Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that the Prophet ﷺ went to her home and as he sat in her home, Umayman radiallahu anha brought out the bread. 
brought out all the food. And the Prophet ﷺ, if he was fasting or he did not want to eat, that she would force the food into his mouth وسلم, and say, Kul. She would put the food right in front of him and say, eat, 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 just like a mom uh, would do, right? So that's the relationship that she has with the Messenger وسلم, A very quiet woman, her reputation, which is uh, just a beautiful thing to have with the Prophet وسلم, She was the person who would make the Prophet وسلم, laugh. There's no one that would make the Prophet وسلم, laugh like Umm Ayman radiallahu ta'ala anha. You can actually trace several of these incidents through the seerah. It starts off with her language. She was an Abyssinian woman, modern day Ethiopia. Her Arabic was very poor and she had a hard time pronouncing things. So sometimes she would say things with the opposite meaning. So when she, when she would say, Salamu alaykum, instead of saying, Salamu Allahi alaykum, some, one time she said the, to the Prophet Sallallahu Salamu alaykum, which means, Salam la alaykum, may peace not be on to you. Just because of her tongue, just because of the way that she would speak, right? And she had a hard time saying, Salamu Allahi alaykum, so she would say, Salam la alaykum. So the Prophet Sallallahu told her, you can just say, As-Salam. All right, so you know when we do texts and we say, Salams, all right, or salam. We got the uh, the narration, except we, we're not tongue tied. But still, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told her, "You know what? When you enter upon me, just say as salam. All right, you don't have to say uh, more than that." Uh, Abu Huwaydah he narrates. He says that Umm Hayman radiallahu anha used to be behind the battle lines in the battle, and she would give these encouraging messages. But sometimes, because of her language, she messed things up. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to look at her, and he would laugh. And uh, on the day of Hunayn, she was saying, Sabbat Allahu Aqdamakum. Instead of Thabbat, may Allah make your feet firm. She was saying, Sabbat Allahu Aqdamakum. May Allah make your, your feet, it actually has no meaning, Sabbat, right? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looked at her and he laughed and he said, Uskuti ya Um Ayman, fa inna ki isra al lisan. said, Be quiet, O Um Ayman, you have, a, you, have a, you have a rough tongue. All right? So even on the day of battle, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would joke with her. He wasn't saying that to be mean to her. Uh, one of the f- famous stories between the Prophet ﷺ and her, Um Ayman came to the Prophet ﷺ and said to him, Ihmilni, uh, carry me. Now she doesn't mean carry me physically. She means bring me a camel or something. So the Prophet ﷺ said to her, Ahmiluki ala waladin naqa. He said, look, I'll bring you the son of a she-camel, child of a she-camel, the baby of a she-camel to carry you. So Um Ayman radiallahu ta'ala anha said, لا يطيقني ولا أريد. It's not going to be able to carry me, nor do I want a baby of a she camel. So the Prophet وسلم, said, I'm not going to carry you except on the baby of a she camel. And she was confused by this. She said, What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, why don't you want to get me a camel? So he said to her, Ya Um Ayman, is there any camel except that it's the child of another camel? All right? So the Prophet وسلم, كان يمازيحها, he used to always uh, laugh with her, joke with her, call her his mother. But this was the woman sallallahu alaihi wasallam that when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi looked at her, he was comforted. When she looked at him, she was always looking at him with the eye of care, with that eye of love. And of course, in the serious moments, um, she followed the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam through and through. Ibn Abbas sallallahu ta'ala anhu, <clears throat> he actually narrates that when the daughter, when 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 a, when a young child of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was dying. The Prophet ﷺ picked up the child and he held the child to his chest sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the Prophet ﷺ put his hand on the child and then the child died in front of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So there's a child that died in the hands of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Um Ayman radiallahu anha was present. So the Prophet ﷺ started to cry. And so when Um Ayman saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi crying, she too started to cry, right? Seeing the death of that child in the hands of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was very soft-hearted and his eyes were swelled with tears and so she started to cry as well. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to her, Ya Um Ayman, uh, atabkeen, oh Um Ayman, why are you crying? She said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, I'm crying because you're crying. You know, that, uh, of course I'm crying, you're crying too. We're both crying over the same thing. And so she said, "Mali la abki wa Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam yabki." Why should I not cry when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is crying? So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Inni less to abki wa la kinnha rahma." He said, "Look, I'm not weeping, but instead it is mercy." 
Uh, what he means by that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that the crying that I have is not one of displeasure or questioning of God. It's one of compassion. I'm crying out of compassion and love for the child, just so she does not mistake the crying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as one of questioning Allah's decree with the, uh, with the death of that child. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to her, Al-Mu'minu bi khayrin ala kulli hal tunza'u nafsuhu min bayni janbayhi wa huwa yahmadu Allah Azza wa Jal. That the believer is in good, the believer is, is in good whatever the situation, meaning the believer is, is fine and uh, is in a state of contentment no matter what the situation is. She, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, even when his soul is being pulled from his body, he remains in praise of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He remains in praise of his Lord. Meaning that this is compassion, this is mercy, but I'm not questioning the decree of Allah. Even with this child, even with this death, even with something that naturally brings out the rahmah, the mercy from the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm not crying um, over that uh, uh, authentic hadith in Sunan Nasa'i uh, that's uh, narrated on the part of Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. So Umayma radiallahu anha has this history with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that's mainly in the background, right? You don't actually have many narrations from her, but you know that she is his mother, you know that she is the first one to carry him, you know that she is someone that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam honored uh, throughout all circumstances, and you can imagine this woman when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died. Can you imagine her entire purpose in life was defined by that moment that she held the Prophet Sallallahu It's a miracle that she did not die when the Prophet Sallallahu died. And what's said about Umm Ayman radiallahu ta'ala anha, who was with the Prophet Sallallahu when that child died and heard those messages from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that she went completely silent, wouldn't talk to anybody, sort of withdrew from society. Uh, she watched the scene in Medina as the people wept and cried and as they buried the Prophet ﷺ, the only person that was in the room when the Prophet ﷺ came out of his mother's womb and she sees this ummah of over a hundred thousand people now crying and weeping over the death of the Prophet ﷺ, and she watches from afar as they bury the Prophet ﷺ, and she keeps a distance from the people. Uh, she becomes uh, very quiet, very silent, doesn't really talk much, doesn't really joke much anymore being the only person who was with the Prophet ﷺ from the day that he was born until the day of his death And she was someone who witnessed, subhanAllah, she witnessed the death of her first husband. Then she witnessed the death of her son Ayman al-Habashi who was martyred at the Battle of Hunayn. Then she witnessed the death of her second husband Zayd ibn al-Haritha who was martyred in the Battle of Mu'tah. Then she witnessed the death of the Prophet ﷺ. Then she witnessed the death of her second son, Usama bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. So Umm Ayman radiallahu anha actually lived, uh, some of the scholars say she lived to see the age of 100 years old. So she lived all the way through every single person that came into her life from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam onwards. And she lived through the khilafah of Abu Bakr and she lived through the khilafah of Umar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, be pleased with them both. And she saw all of those people that were beloved to her one by one um, um, buried. There's a story, uh, a narration in Bukhari, that after the death of the Prophet Wasallam, Abu Bakr and Umar wanted to visit Umm Ayman because the Prophet Wasallam used to visit Umm Ayman. Think about your status in society when Abu Bakr and Umar want to visit you after the death of the Prophet Wasallam. right? They're, they're going together to visit her, to help her grieve, to help her get over her situation and they get into the home, they sit with the Prophet ﷺ, and as soon as they sit, I'm sorry, they sit with Umm Ayman ta'ala anha, as soon as they sit with her, she starts to cry. When they see her crying, what are they assuming? Why is she crying? She misses the Prophet ﷺ, right? They're, they're, they assume that she's crying over that. And they would, that's a pretty safe assumption to make. This is the only purpose that she had in her entire life was being that watchful eye, right? Over the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi trying to, to preserve him, to protect him, to take care of him. And so as she starts to cry, Abu Bakr and Umar, they start to tell her, uh, don't cry, O Umm Ayman, don't you know that what Allah had in store for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is better than what he had over here? Meaning, you know, they, they're, they're speaking to the natural emotion of a mother that don't you know that what is with him now, what Allah has given him now, 
is better than that which he left here. And she says something extremely profound. She says to them, I know that what Allah has given to the Prophet ﷺ is better than what he had over here. She said, that's not, not why I'm crying. He said, then why are you crying? She said, أَبْكِي لِأَنَّ الْوَحْيَ قَدْ انْقَطَعْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ She said, I'm crying because the revelation has ceased to come from the heavens. And so Abu Bakr and Umar started to weep. And Anas ibn Malik عنه, said, they all three of them wept for a long time together. SubhanAllah, imagine the scene of Umm Ayman, Abu Bakr and Umar all sitting together crying over that profound statement that we used to have a direct connection to the heavens in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ, right? The revelation was coming fresh through the mouth of that man ﷺ, that boy who I carried and nursed and took care of. And now that revelation uh, has ceased to come down. So it was a longing for the revelation as well. Uh, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, she then outlived Abu Bakr. And then she lived to see the assassination of Umar. And she died about 20 days after Umar ibn Khattab anhu was assassinated. And she was buried in al baqir uh, which is the graveyard right next to the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. But Ibn Asakir has a beautiful narration. It says that when they buried Umm Ayman anha, they made sure that they buried her with a direct, where, where she was directly uh, in line with the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. So it's like she's adjacent to the Prophet ﷺ, she's facing the Qibla just like the Prophet ﷺ, buried there in Al-Baqir radiallahu ta'ala anha, uh, looking forward that way. And there are so many lessons we can learn from this woman and her life. Obviously, her place in history. The character of the Prophet ﷺ and honoring this woman and upholding her. Right When the Prophet ﷺ says that there is no virtue of an Arab over a non-Arab or a non-Arab over an Arab, or a white person over a black person, or a black person over a white person. The Prophet ﷺ elevated this woman in her status, despite her not having a tribe, despite her skin color, despite her gender, despite uh, her poverty, despite all of that, the Prophet ﷺ held her in that esteem, and it forces society as a whole to look at this woman that otherwise would be neglected, and look at her with that status of being the mother of the Prophet ﷺ. So it's the attitude of the Prophet ﷺ, the testimony of the Prophet ﷺ towards her that's so powerful. It's also her connection, her love of the Prophet ﷺ, her sacrifice. One of the things about Umm Ayman anha is that you find a woman that never once complained, never once complained about being in the service of the Prophet ﷺ, about being in the service of something greater, about the hardship that she faced in that purpose because she understood that it was something purposeful. And you see that hum humanity of the Prophet ﷺ, you see that, uh, that deep love and that affection of the Prophet ﷺ, but you also see this deep commitment of this woman uh, to the Prophet ﷺ. And you have to ask yourself that question, you know, when we do work for this higher purpose of deen, right? And someone asks you, how are you? And you say, you know what? Muslims are driving me crazy. The masjid is this, these people are this, sometimes I want to just give it all up, right? I'm sick of dealing with it all. And what was her answer? Ana bi khair, madam islam bi khair. I'm good as long as Islam is good. Meaning, you know, for the cause that I'm dedicated to, I'm okay. I'm okay. So that, that, that idea of commitment uh, is something that you find in Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha and something that you find uh, in this remarkable woman, Baraka Um Ayman radiallahu ta'ala anha, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with her, to uh, to elevate her, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward her for her care for the Prophet ﷺ, her sacrifice, and to join us with her.